Good morning, everybody. You all awake? Oh, I have a handout. So I guess I got to hand it to you. But I'm bum. There's a couple. Well, in Christology, in Christology, we are now at the reign of Christ. Obviously, this is not going to be uh, any kind of a lesson or teaching that, strictly speaking, that is about the millennium, because the millennium, just like the last topic, is massively large. So what I do want to do is draw your attention to the very first top part of this chart here, where we read about comparison of Christian millennial teachings. As you can see by the top illustration there, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on any of these, post-tribulational millennialism. So much as other millennial positions that they're so that the rapture happens before a literal kingdom on the earth, except with the church going through the tribulation, but raptured at the end before returning with Christ to reign on the earth, which is interesting. You've got a lot of people out there today talking about, um, well, yeah, the church is supposed to go through the tribulation. So that's kind of where this, is, this position is at. It's one of those. And I tried to get these definitions from the folks themselves and what they have to say about their positions. Um, skip down to the third one, post-millennialism. And it's just like it sounds. Post-millennialism is that second coming is right before the, uh, the last judgment. Here's what they say. Post-millennialism, post that's easy for me to say, is the view or system of eschatology, which is the doctrine of last things, that the current age is, is the millennium. So you're in it, folks. Enjoy it now. Which is not necessarily a thousand years. When they say the thousand years in Revelation 20, they'll just say that means figuratively a really long time. Um, Post-millennialists believe that the kingdom of Jesus Christ will gradually be extended through the preaching of the gospel. The eventual conversion of majority of people, not necessarily all people, and the progressive growth of righteousness, prosperity, and development in every sphere of life. As this growing majority of Christians struggle to subdue the world for Christ. Are we succeeding? Only after Christianity has dominated the world for a long time will Jesus Christ then return. After the church's glorious reign of victory... Like all millennialism, there will be a general resurrection, destruction of the present creation, and entry into the new state. Post-millennialism differs from premillennialism and amillennialism in that post-millennialists are optimistic that the victory will be realized without the need of a cataclysmic return of Christ to impose righteousness. Is that what he's doing? He's imposing it? Instead, they believe that it will result from the faithful application of the present process. All millennialism, down on the very bottom, everything is symbolic with all millennialism. According to all millennialists, the term is not a happy one. It suggests that all millennialists either do not believe in any millennium or that they simply ignore the first six verses of Revelation 20, which speak of a millennial reign. Neither of these two statements is true. Though it is true that the all millennialists do not believe in a literal thousand year earthly reign, which will follow the return of Christ, the term all millennialism, I'm having trouble with this word this morning, is not an accurate description of the view. Professor J.E. Adams of Westminster Seminary, he's an excellent biblical counselor, by the way, in Philadelphia, has suggested that the term all millennialism be replaced by the expression realized millennialism. 
The latter term, to be sure, describes the amillennial position more accurately than the usual term, since amillennialists believe that the millennium of Revelation 20 is not exclusively future, but is now in process of realization. The expression realized millennialism, however, is a rather clumsy one, replacing a simple prefix with a three-syllable word. Despite the disadvantages and limitations of the word, therefore, I shall continue to use the shorter and more common term, amillennialism. So none of those particular belief systems are what we follow here at the Master's Church. We teach premillennialism is, um, you know, we are looking for the Lord. We come upon the rapture of the church. We go through a seven-year tribulation period. At the end of the tribulation period, it culminates in the second coming of Christ where he returns and establishes his kingdom on the earth for a thousand years. So we should all be familiar with that. But Okay, just as to go through an overview of this. I wish we had a lot of time to go through the, all the details of this, but we don't. At any point, if I am confusing something, as much as the way I'm pronouncing some stuff, then shoot your hand up and we'll see if we can explain it. Okay, there's enough people in the room that maybe we can discuss it and explain what exactly is going on. So, so anyway, many are aware of the debates concerning which view of the millennium is taught in the Bible. So, um, many believe that this is happening spiritually and as we discussed last week with the return of Christ, we teach and we believe that we understand the scripture literally, that we take it literally, not figuratively. Where the scripture is figurative, um, it makes it clear in the, within the text, within the context. So contrary to what some critics have claimed, premillennial, I'm just really having issues. Wait, let me do this. wake my tongue up too. Now let's see if that worked. Premillennialism has deep roots in the Old Testament and New Testament texts outside of Revelation 20. Overall, the case for premillennialism involves the kingdom mandate, as it's called, in um, Genesis 1, 26 to 28. If, you, if you'd like to turn there, you don't have to necessarily. I'm going to read it real quick. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. And this is where we see it begins. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them and blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So this reveals a strong connection between man and earth. God made man in his image and instructed him to rule over the earth and its creatures. The connections further explained in the detailed account of man's creation in Genesis 2, where God formed man from the dust of the ground. That's in 2.7. And the Hebrew word for man is Adam, and the term for ground is Adama. The close connection between Adam and Adama emphasizes the relationship between man and the ground he's to rule over. That's another one of those occasions that didn't end well. So God, and so God told man to rule over Creation. So the Hebrew word for rule, which is used twice in Genesis 1, 26 to 28, is reda and means have dominion, rule, or to dominate. The term used later of the Messiah's future reign, um, we, can, we can read that in Psalm 110.2. Psalm 110.2 says, The Lord will stretch forth your young scepter from Zion, saying, Rule, rada, in the midst of your enemies. So thus, there's a royal and a kingly aspect to the language in Genesis 1. So the realm of this kingdom rule 
for man is the earth, not heaven. That's why we make those connections there where we're looking, because there's a, a lot of understanding that, well, it's figurative, and that um, this kingdom is going to be in heaven, or this kingdom is among us and it's figurative, it's spiritual. But yet there's a, the establishment in these earlier passages, like in Genesis, has to do with the earth. Now, I haven't forgotten, I haven't forgotten that last week I, I handed out um, a homework assignment. I don't know if, if anybody did it or not. But if you would, again, I want to, this is an excellent thing to look at. Look in Daniel chapter 2. Ezekiel, Daniel. All right. You remember Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And part of that challenge was remember they he wanted to know what the what the dream was, or he had this dream that was disturbing him, and he, all his uh his assistant said, hey, you know, tell us and we'll, we'll give you the interpretation. And he says, no, 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 no. He says, I want to know for certain that I'm really getting the real dream. So what I want you to do is I want you to tell me what the dream was and also give me the definition. And then there was a, a threat of, of death if they couldn't do it. So Daniel himself prayed over, over the matter and he, he asked. And um, so then ultimately in verse 20, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises, king, raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, God. Then down at the very end of the verse, he says, for you've made known to us the king's demand. So then Daniel goes on to explain the, the, uh, the dream. He says, don't destroy the wise, the wise men, the wise guys of uh, Babylon. Um, Daniel goes on, let's see here. Verse 27, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, magicians, the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. Verse 29, as for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. So Daniel, the king, Nebuchadnezzar has been given a vision of the future. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have uh, more wisdom than anyone living, but for our sakes, who makes known the interpretation to the king, that you may know that the thoughts or know the thoughts of your heart. 31, you, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image, the great image whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. The king's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands and struck the image on its feet of clay and it broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were crushed together and became like shaft from the summer thrashing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Okay, so real quick, pop quiz. So starting verse 32, the, the um, head of gold of this image, where do we find, how do we know how to interpret this? As this is clearly some um, symbolic language here. So how do we understand how to understand the symbolism? It's right there in the text. Come on, help me out, guys. Daniel gives it to us. Daniel gives it to us. All right, thank you. Someone spoke up. That was brave. All right, <laughs> beginning which verse?
Come on, anybody can speak up. I don't... 38? All right. All right, there we go. That's one way to understand symbolism in the Bible. Okay, but here's the thing. Wherever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand, and he's made the ruler over them, and you are this head of gold. So the head of gold is symbolic of a kingdom. Which kingdom is that? Babylon. And then we, we have the chest and the arms. Who's that? Is it Medo-Persia? Right? We also have, oh, we have silver. We have Greece in there. We have iron. And that's Rome. Okay? Where, let me ask you, were those actual kingdoms on the earth? Those were literal kingdoms on the earth. Okay? And we're told, it hasn't happened yet, but we're told that there are going to be feet mixed with clay and iron and ten toes and all that good stuff. So is there any reason to believe that this future kingdom that looks like that is symbolic, if the other ones were literal? How about the stone that comes down and rolls and crushes the whole thing on the earth? So this is an excellent example to keep in your hip pocket. Daniel chapter 2, when you're talking to somebody who thinks that the kingdom that is, is uh, coming might actually be here, that we're in the kingdom now. So again, and I mentioned last week that if the kingdom were now, we would also be able to let our children play over a pit of vipers. We'd see the wolf laying down with the lamb. We'd see all these types of things. And if those things are symbolic, it's symbolic of what symbolism is that your kid can play over a, a pit of vipers. So everything here is literal. We've got this giant stone who's Christ who comes and crushes everything and he establishes his kingdom on the earth. So I would, that's why I said to look this up and, and read it this last week. Um, because it's important to know, it's a good thing to know. So when somebody tries to tell you the only place you find the millennium in the Bible is in Revelation chapter 20, hopefully you can correct them that um, the kingdom is going to be on the earth and it will be literal, and that's why we take this position. So let's see. Also, uh, I think I already covered Psalm 115.16. Kingdom is on earth. Let's see. So I'll skip some passages here. There's so much here. It's amazing. Oh, um, Psalm 8 6. It says basically the same thing. Verse 4, What is man that you're mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. O Lord our God, how excellent is your name in all the earth. So here you have kingdom on earth. Uh, that theme is picked up, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul's great resurrection chapter there. You can turn there real quick. I'm going to hit a couple of these highlights. We have to think some things that I think are important uh, that we don't always hear about. We hear about the, king, the kingdom or the millennium, and we hear often about um, what it's going to be like and when it's going to be established and how long it is, but we don't get into some of these little details that I think are, it's a shame. We should know some of these things. Because we're, we're told to know not only what we believe, but why we believe what we believe, right? And hopefully it's not just because the guy in front of us or a Sunday school teacher or somebody told us this is what you'll believe. First Corinthians 15, um, look at verse 25. Well, verse 24. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. That's what's going to happen at the very end of the millennium. I don't know if you realize that or not or how many times you read that, but 
Jesus is going to actually deliver all things into the Father's hand at the very end before we go into eternity future. Verse 25, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. Scriptures say, but when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is expected. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who, he, um, put, who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So that's another aspect here of the millennium that brings up a lot of questions sometimes folks don't understand where, where Christ is reigning. So Christ comes, right? We have the second coming. We talked about this last week. So we got the tribulation period. Then we have the second coming. Jesus, is established, Jesus establishes his kingdom, right? So some of the things that we see in the millennium are um, we know people live a long time, maybe even could potentially could live through the whole thing, but if somebody dies at the age of 100, it's as if they're a child or a baby, right? So that kind of thing happens. But we also read of children in the millennium. We read of old men in the millennium. So it's not like everybody has their glorified bodies. Now, these people who are in the millennium who are, I guess we call them mortals. So we've got immortals because we're going to return with Christ. And Old Testament saints are going to be raised up. All the promises that were to Israel from back in Genesis now are going to be fulfilled at this time. Israel is going to be restored. Jerusalem is going to be restored in all kinds of glorious ways. Fresh spring water is going to break out there at the Mount of Olives and flood the whole earth, purify everything. But then you've got people in here with babies and stuff. Okay, now where did the, where did the mortals in the kingdom come from? Louder. I heard somebody's... The tribulation. They're the survivors, right? So... What happens is at the end of the tribulation, you're going to have um, a bunch of uh, mortals. Not all of them are going to be believers. Do you remember there's a judgment called that we call the sheep and goats judgment in Matthew 25, right? So what happens is at the end of this period, one of the events that happens is God separates the sheep from the goats. This is where we get the terminology about you're either on his right hand or you're on his left hand. So the sheep go into the kingdom and they can have children. So the only ones entering into the kingdom are going to be believers. Now I have another question. I'm going to just see how much you folks are, have um, read up on this. This is a, a good test for me too. So Christ is bound for a thousand years, right? We have this in, in Revelation 20. What? Satan. What did I say? Christ is not bound up. Christ has Satan bound up for a thousand years. Thank you. Okay, so Satan is bound for a thousand years, and then he's released for a little while. And he raises up a rebellion to go up against Jerusalem where Christ is on his throne. Where do the unbelievers come from? They're born, exactly, they're born of the world. They're not born as believers, right? None of us are. So, all right, you guys are good. You're sharp. I'm just testing. Um, also in Ephesians, uh, Ephesians 1.22 is another one to look at. Same type of language. Same, same writer, Paul, same author of the Holy Spirit. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And there's that fill alls in all thing with him. So we do you see the, the reach of his kingdom among believers. So we also have a, um, a couple, you have Hebrews 2, verses 5 to 8. So with Ephesians 1.22, Jesus' resurrection and ascension are the reasons for God putting all things subject under his feet. So the authority to rule, 
the earth is granted to Jesus by the Father and will be exercised by Jesus when he comes again. And that's what we, we got in Psalm 110. Um, so the millennial kingdom will highlight the successful reign of the last Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 calls him that, calls Christ that, in the realm where the first Adam failed. When Jesus comes again, he will share this reign and those who identify with him. There's a bunch of passages. Well, the whole book of Revelation. Okay, Revelation 2, 26 and 27, Revelation 3, 21, and also Revelation 20 are some examples. Uh, we see while Jesus is the ultimate king in Revelation eleven fifteen, for example, his followers are also a kingdom, and they will reign upon the earth in Revelation 5, 10. So we're going to be reigning with Christ. Um, so this section here, the millennium that we call the, the millennium, sometimes in, in theological terms, they'll call it the mediatorial reign. It's an, it's an intermediate reign because what happens at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth? Anybody know? Because I don't know. All we know is we reign with him forever. Eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, nor has it even entered in. You know, we can't, it's beyond our imagining what God has in store for those who love him. So he's got something prepared for us going into eternity future. We have, we have language in here, too, about um, how the Word of God is, is as eternal and as everlasting as, for instance, the moon. It won't cease its shining. We have language about the earth um, forever and ever. The Ezekiel's kingdom that is built in the millennium is supposed to be here forever and ever. Why do you think that there's going to be a temple in the millennium. Let me back up. Why was there a temple and sacrifices in the Old Testament? Okay, if we got Christ comes and he's the Lamb of God, he's the sacrifice. So what was all that for? The point to the cross, the point to the coming Lamb. So, we're going to have um, mortals born in the kingdom who never knew any of this stuff, never saw any of it. They're going to have take our word for it. I guess we'll still have the scripture. Maybe we'll, you know, I'm sure we will still have the written word because it's supposed to last forever, along with the living word. So that's where the term will come up sometimes that it'll be memorial type of a temple. If you want to think of it like a museum, you can think of it like a museum, but I tell you what, everybody's going to be visiting there and uh, observing some of the Lord's feast days. These aren't Jewish feast days. Leviticus 23, the Lord told Israel, and remember that this, this all comes together with God's promises to Israel. The tribulation period is all about Israel. The prophetic clock for Israel stopped it, you know, seven minutes to midnight. Then it's going to pick up again when you have the great tribu or the tribulation period. And the tribulation is all about the salvation of the Jewish nation. So we are raptured out. It's all about Israel. Then in God's economy, we share in those all those riches during the millennium. So we've got all this time here in the Old Testament that is about uh, pointing to the Messiah, the Lamb of God. In the kingdom, you've got all the promises to Israel. Israel is still there. The, the church, the body of Christ, which is us, where are we going to be during the millennium? We're going to be ruling and reigning New Jerusalem, We've, we see New Jerusalem, there's a, a number of passages in the scriptures that describe New Jerusalem, and you have it in Revelation 21, and it, it's described as like, I don't know, it's a giant Star Trek Borg 
cubed kind of a thing. It's massive. It's roughly the mass of uh, one third of the size of the moon, as I understand it. It's massive. So it's, it's going to be partially in space. Jesus left in, in the Gospels. Where did he say he was going? Yeah, in his father's house or many, many rooms. Uh, in old King James, it was in my father's house or many mansions or something. The better translation is in my father's mansion or many rooms. That's probably a better translation. So in the ancient Hebrew wedding tradition, what would happen is, is um, there's the betrothal. The um, bridegroom leaves a parting gift with the bride. With the, it's a promise that he's going to come back. What was our parting gift? Very good, yeah. And we got the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2. So he leaves the Holy Spirit, the comforter, with us, who's the paraclete, the go-between. And so he goes away for a season, and he goes to his father's house. It's not like modern times where you get married and you go rent an apartment or you buy a small home. They used to go to the father's house and they'd do a room addition to the house. They would just keep expanding it from generation to generation. It would probably be passed on unless they migrated somewhere else and then they started all over and built. So Jesus went to build a big room addition and it's going to be New Jerusalem. And it comes down because we return with him, right? We're not going to be hanging out up there, way up there. We're going to be we return with him and we rule with him on the earth for a thousand years. So we're ruling with him. In, in old Jerusalem, the mortals have old Jerusalem, and they're still going to be observing the things in the Old Testament, like the Lord's feast days. And we're told in the Old Testament scriptures, too, that if they don't come, like Egypt, if they don't come and they don't come over that, the king's highway and migrate to Jerusalem for these seasons, God was going to shut the rain off during the millennium for, as a discipline for any nation that does that. So all the nations, all the nations are supposed to come to Jerusalem during those seasons. Interesting, isn't it? So we have all this stuff that is symbolic in the sense it points to Christ. It points to the Lamb of God. So there is definitely absolutely symbolism in the, in the scripture. But it's not kind of some of the ways we think. So... We're told that there, both the Father and Jesus are on the throne in New Jerusalem in Revelation 22, 3, which is interesting. And the same reigns forever over the earth, Revelation 22, 5. So this leads to an eternal reign in the eternal kingdom. Uh, and your chart, I hope you make good use of it. Let's see, so what else do we want to cover in here? There's so, so much, like I said, that we can't possibly cover it all. Um, that's where we get passages too, by the way. Like Isaiah, Isaiah 9, 6 to 7, um, revealed that a child, uh, the son Jesus, will be born. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his kingdom of his kingdom there will be no end. The Jews were told in the Old Testament, for instance, that um, when he establishes the kingdom, that you know, all the promises of the promised land that get him, he says, you will walk where your fathers walked forever and ever. Um, Psalm 2, David told of a coming day, God will establish his king upon Mount Zion in Jerusalem, where he will rule the nations in the realm where they once rebelled against God. Psalm 72 predicts the time when a righteous Davidic king will rule from sea to sea, from river, from the river to the ends of the earth. That's Psalm, Psalm 72, 8. All nations will serve him, 72, 11. The king will deliver the needy and the afflicted, in verse 12. He'll also have compassion on the poor and the needy, in verse 13. And during this time, there will be abundance of grain in the earth on top of the mountains, in verse 16. So these depictions can't be spiritualized or allegorized to purely spiritual blessings, nor can these be fulfilled with the church. These anticipate conditions of a coming earthly kingdom. Psalm 119, 
or Psalm 110, I'm sorry, is an explicitly messianic text which describes the coming earthly reign of David's Lord, the Messiah, from Jerusalem after a session of the Father's right hand in heaven. So again, between that, Daniel 2, all these things are literally fulfilled. Um, what else can we do? Oh, um, may as well mention this. We've got time a little bit here. Isaiah 65, uh, it points to the inter, this intermediate period of uh, Isaiah 65, 20, discussing these conditions. It says, um, 65, 17 says, No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days, or an old man who does not fill out his house or his days, for the child shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. So when this prophecy is fulfilled, all of this 17, all up through 20, somewhere up in there, the whole passage. When this prophecy is fulfilled, people will live so long that if they die at an age of 100, something must be wrong, since people will live much longer than that. In fact, it will be assumed that a person dying at page 100, or page, at age 100, must be a curse. So notice two important things here in Isaiah 65, 20, an increased longevity of life and the presence of sin, which brings curses and death. So sin will still be present. But in the eternal state, there'll no longer be, never, no longer be any sin. Any questions so far? Now's the time to ask. Um, I could just real quick give you Zechariah 8. It's, it's one that Isaiah gets looked at often. This Isaiah's the gospel of the Old Testament, right? So we read uh, Isaiah a lot. We don't always read Zechariah, and we should. Oh, let's see. So Zechariah 8 offers some descriptions of the kingdom of God, or God's coming in a kingdom when Jesus returns. The chapter begins with God restoring Jerusalem. Um, we see great wrath and jealousy in verse 2. Uh, the Lord returns and dwells in Jerusalem in verse 3. Uh, the great city will have another name, the City of Truth. Um, this capital city will of uh, God's kingdom will be characterized by sweet peace and fellowship. And the Lord himself says, uh, verses 4 and 5 says, This is the Lord of hosts. Old men and old women will again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each man with his staff in hand because of age. And the streets of the city will be filled with boys and girls playing in the streets. So it's an interesting picture there. What we is not clear is if the age is because you're at age 900 and the end of the millennium is coming or if it's because those people entered into the kingdom and they were old already and they're just preserved at that age. Um, I don't know that any passage says. That's a good question. We'll find out. If you ever find a passage that clarifies that, let me know. Because <laughs> I don't know if they entered in old or if that's just a depiction if, if they age. Because I tend to think they entered in old. Because I tend to think, and I could be wrong, it's possible, it's been known to happen. What happened with the Jews when they were wandering in the wilderness? What did the Lord do? Remember how the Lord, now they aged, but remember how he preserved their clothing and things? They didn't wear out, their shoes didn't wear out. So I don't know how some of this, we know God does these types of things, so I don't know how that works though with people in the kingdom. I honestly don't. But if you flip up a couple, too, Zechariah 14, you should just read the whole book of Zechariah. Uh, but it, it describes the kingdom conditions after the return of Jesus to earth. Um, well, Orthodox Judaism, Orthodox Judaism, they're looking for a little, literal Messiah to come and establish his kingdom on the earth. So it's going to be a lot like post-millennialism in some ways. The earth is going to get, I don't think they're looking for the earth to get into a perfect 
condition. Now I've emailed, talked to, and I found articles by various rabbis on what orthodox rabbis are looking for is they're looking for um, a man to come who's got to be a Jew. He's got to be, he must be a Jew, must be of the line of David, and they're looking for the one that's going to build them their temple. And they say, if he comes in and he meets those conditions, then he's the Messiah. And they're just ready for him to come and set everything straight. So some of these things will be symbolic? Some of it will be symbolic, yeah. They, they, yeah, they would take it that way. They won't, they will ignore, they call Daniel chapter 9, the forbidden chapter. And they don't read it. They probably discuss it among themselves, but they don't like their people to. Because what happens in, what is described in Daniel chapter 9? Daniel chapter 9 is where Gabriel comes and gives Daniel this vision, the 70 weeks prophecy. If you follow the 70 weeks prophecy and you follow how much time there is and you count the days, you come up to, uh uh-oh, that had to have been that Jesus guy because the math is in there. So they have to symbolize Daniel 9 away, for instance, to get rid of Christ. There's a lot of things concerning the suffering of the Messiah and so forth that they have to symbolize away because just like the Jews in during the Roman Empire in Christ's day, they were looking for that one on the white horse to come and deliver them. And that's why, you know, you had this discussion even among the disciples. The disciples were doing what? The disciples were saying, who, who gets to sit on your right side? Well, can I sit on your left? And this kind of thing. Or mom, mom is lobbying for, hey, can you let, you know, let my son sit on your right side? And you also had um, Judas was very disappointed. Where did, where did Judas start turning? Judas was never turned completely right. He never really, but when Judas started turning actually against Christ, when Christ started talking about the Son of Man must suffer and all this language, he kept telling them repeatedly and trying to drill into their heads, I got to die first. Judas was, he's like, I'm done. Because he wanted to be the treasurer, right? He's the guy who kept the money. So who doesn't want to keep all the money from, for the kingdom? The Messiah is setting up his kingdom. Dude, I'm the treasurer for the Messiah. Well, all this stuff started coming, and he started talking about all this other language about how the Son of Man must suffer, etc., and die. He wasn't having it. So that's when his true colors came out. So the Orthodox Jews um, will symbolize a lot of this way. They have to symbolize the way the suffering Messiah doesn't. It doesn't fit their economy with what they're looking for. Even though we know there's several passages in the Old Testament that describe it quite thoroughly so but that's about all the time we have any questions any more okay so did not get to really get into the whole kingdom and we knew we weren't going to get into the whole kingdom but that's how the reign of Christ is actual physical reign of Christ upon the earth and um why we teach literal reign of Christ on earth at the Master's Church. Thanks, all. Let's close real quick in prayer. Lord, we look forward to you reigning forever and ever, and we look forward to reigning with you. Or, Lord, I'd just be happy to be a shoeshine boy in your kingdom. This, Lord, being in your presence forever is something that we're looking forward to. And, uh, I, I want to say, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, because this world is not getting any better. and We're told in scriptures that it will not get any better before you return. So, Lord, we ask that you'd strengthen us, give us wisdom, give us understanding, give us the strength of your Holy Spirit. In the meantime, Lord, encourage us to keep looking up, to live holy lives, and to strengthen one another. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks.